Okay, everybody. So as you can see, Drew Paul, the founder of the INUNI organization, did not contact me back. So I'm creating this video for you all, and I'm going to be operating under the premise that there are going to be people who may come across this video who've never seen some of this information before. But for a lot of my astute followers and other astute individuals out there who may not follow me but know about this information, you're going to know about quite a bit of this. But I think that there's going to be some stuff in here that you don't know about. And in this video, I'm going to be mainly focusing on the water situation when it comes to the plans laid out by the United Nations in their SDGs, Sustainable Development Goals. Now, Mr. Drew Paul, who is parroting all of the goals that are laid out by the United Nations with his organization, he claimed to me that he knew nothing about Agenda 21 or Agenda 2030, yet on his very own site, he has exactly that. Let me show you. So right here, INUNI, this is, this is the foundation started by Drew Paul. By 2030, by 2030, by 2030, by 2030, need I keep going on? So for him to throw that barb out to me, that's kind of what kind of pissed me off. Um, is him tr saying that I was like throwing numbers out of my ass, like they didn't really exist. But we know that he really knew that they did exist, right? So that leads to the question, uh, maybe that's a touchy subject that he knows exactly what's all going to come about. And that's why I laid out the questions to him that I did, because I know a lot of bad stuff is about ready to come our way. So with that all being said, let us begin. So Agenda 21 is a plan that was hatched back in 1992, but probably many years before that. But they had a UN conference that they held in Rio de Janeiro, Brazil in 1992. And that is when the whole plan was put into action, or I should say laid out in their, uh, in their documents is exactly what their sustainable development goals were. So the, the 21 in the Agenda 21 stands for not the year that they were planning on bringing this about, but the century, the 21st century. And then they came out with what they call Agenda 2030, transforming our world, the 2030 agenda. So they revised their plans. Um, instead of it being just for the 21st century, they were going to have these plans set in place or these goals set in place by the year 2030. Here's the problem that I have. Let us start off with this infomercial ver video or this video of an infomercial from the United Nations. This is from them. And you notice all of the neat cinematography and how they tried to make it look, so, you know, uh, they tried to pretty it up for everybody and, you know, so it didn't seem so sinister, the message that, that they were trying to uh, uh, put across. Let's listen. The earth just cannot handle the sheer number of humans who live here. Something has to give. And I believe that it's up to us who have lived a good life to make sure that our children will have the opportunity to live good lives too. I have lived a good life. 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 So her message right there is something has to give. And the underlying message here to me is, is that uh, the elderly, um, you should be ready to, uh, you know, sacrifice yourself for the greater good, so to speak. Isn't that the message that you get? Isn't it interesting that th this COVID-19, you know, no matter what you think of it, I, I know what I think of it, but, uh, you know, a lot of the medical professionals out there, not all of them are lying when they, I, I've talked to a couple of myself and they're seeing some very anomalous things when it comes to this COVID-19, when it comes to the elderly and to the people who suffer from underlying conditions, the infirm. Um, these uh, pulmonary embolisms, these blood clots, these all of these things going on, and it seems to be targeting targeting the elderly demographic and the people with underlying conditions. Is this a part of the agenda? Heck, it could be. I don't know, but I'll tell you this: 
So Agenda 21 was hatched in 1992, right? Okay, so let me show you this. Does everybody remember scenes like this coming out of the country of Rwanda? Not more than two years, just a little under two years after this plan was hatched with the Sustainable Development Goals of the Agenda 21 program, this is what took place in Rwanda. Does everybody remember? A hundred days of slaughter, the Rwanda genocide. In a hundred days in 1994, 800,000 people were slaughtered. And do you know what's really interesting about this whole genocide? Let me show you that. The United Nations knew that this slaughter was going on. The United States knew, Belgium knew, France knew, all kinds of uh, the United Kingdom. They all knew that this genocide was taking place. But yet the opinion of some, the reason why the United Nations and peacekeepers did nothing is one, is because the United Nations peacekeeping uh, or the United Nations itself was fatigued, um, which is really interesting because what do you think is going to happen when they try to implement these goals with countries that are not going to go along with the program? Uh, you're going to have a lot on your hands. Inaction was due to national interest, they say. That's why the United States did not in involve themselves in the genocide of Rwanda. Well, because they had no, na they had no national interest vested in the country. And uh, there were, uh, you know what's a sad thing? France. There were soldiers, uh, uh, it's alleged, that, that French soldiers were actually training some of these killers on how to dispatch their victims in a quick, easy manner. How to tie them up, how to slice their throat, how to beat their heads in, how to do all that stuff. And this was being, they were being trained by French soldiers. Now, let me show you a few other things here. Does everybody know how much money it's going to take to implement these goals and to bring them about if it's really that they're, that's their intention? If all of these goals are what you really have, uh, uh, want to attain for the globe, um, it's going to be a lot of money, wouldn't you agree? Well, it's interesting. In the field, UNMAIR was ill-equipped to stop the killings in the Rwandan genocide due to constant pressure by the Security Council to save money. To save money. So that is their excuse for why they didn't, they didn't do anything more to stop the genocide in its tracks. The only time Delaire was allowed to use force other than in self-defense was when he requested to help the evacuation of foreign nationals. This shows that Western states simply put the lives of white people above that of Africans. Hmm. So tell me, if this was going on, this genocide, two years after you created this, this whole plan, you, you, you laid out this plan to, to, to come to fruition sometime in the future, but yet somehow Rwanda got left out of the whole equation? So whatever was going on there, it did really mattered not to you? So now my question is, is that when they come about bringing upon us these goals that they have, in, it, it, that they want to bring about, what part of all those goals are not going to include certain countries or even the United States? How about when people start to uh, protesting, when we're going to protest the, the bringing about of these goals, what does that going to mean for us? FEMA camps? Is it going to mean... I'm going to show you some very interesting things here, folks, uh, when it comes to the whole water situation. And you read this. The main actors, Belgium, the U.S., and France, had sufficient information on what was going on in Rwanda and the quick and effective evacuation of foreign nationals, as well as France's intervention in July, show that they also had the capacity to intervene. But they did not. Those Rwandan lives mattered not to any of these countries or the United Nations. So, who, since we're going to be talking about mainly the water situation when it comes to these sustainable development goals, uh, we have to start off with one of the worst actors there are. Now, this corporation has a very bad track record when it comes to the water rights, privatization, privatization of water, excuse me, 
And uh, uh, so let's take a look at Nestle and let's look at exactly what they have to say about SDG, Sustainable Development Goals, and their role to play in the whole matter. Nestle, contributing to global goals, creating shared values is mapped against the United Nations 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development. We helped to shape the 17 Sustainable Development Goals, and now we are working hard to achieve them. Does everybody realize the track record that Nestle has when it comes to water resources around this planet? Straight from Nestle themselves. In September 2018, the United Nations Global Compact launched the Collaborative Action Platform for Peace, Justice, and Strong Institutions. We joined as one of its founding patrons because we think it is crucial to build environments based on strong corporate governance and compliance. In Ecuador, we launched a tailor-made program for small, medium-sized enterprises focusing on the prevention of bribery and corruption. I'm sure you did. So with their uh, sustainable development goal number six, they made it pretty clear that water is an important part of their business. Now, Nestle, it's not just do water, but as you noticed, um, the water industry is the, one of the biggest things um, besides the oil industry, the auto industry. Well, is the auto industry even relevant anymore? Maybe not. Maybe not as relevant, but we know the bottled water corporations, Pepsi, Coca-Cola, Nestle, they are all extremely relevant, and they do lay it out here plainly for you that water is essential to life and our business. Water is the planet's most precious resource and a fundamental human right. Uh, yeah, you, that's not what you believe, so stop it. Stop that. It's also essential to our business. For our bottled water, the crops grow by our suppliers and the process is used to manufacture. And whoops, sorry about that. Uh, caring, for, caring for water, an integrated approach to promoting good water stewardship. Now, I want you to, that, that's going to be the new in vogue word right here, stewardship, because that's the one word we're going to be looking at. Our global efforts to improve our environment performance involve stewarding water resources for future generations. Um, stewarding for who? Who put you in charge? Well, yeah, let's take a look at all this. So now you think with one of the SDGs is to, to for, for life below water, you know, the fish, the, the, all the, the aquatic life. With all of the plastic that is that has invaded our oceans, you would think that these corporations like Nestle, Pepsi, and all others would be uh, using some of their money to clean up these oceans from all of the plastic bottles that they've created in their in their markets to feed the appetites of 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 humans for their bottled water needs. So all of these wa all these bottles have made into the ocean. How much money do you think has come from Nestle, Pepsi, or Coca-Cola to clean up the oceans? Absolutely none. I have found none. But do you know what Nestle makes clear about improving their margins? Okay. This approach enables us to free up resources to reinvest in product innovation and brand building. To hell with the oceans. To hell with any of the sustainable development goals that are going on. We're not going to put our money into that. No, no. We are going to put money into our bottom line, into creating better products, newer products for the consumers, creating value for our customers as well as our shareholders. Our priorities, see this? Our priorities are to invest in the long-term growth and development of the business while increasing shareholder returns and creating shared value. Our preference is to allocate capital towards value-creating investments to expand the company's core food and beverage product line. Yeah. So as I already spoke on a lot of the, the, the biggest, and we, we looked at Nestle. We're going to be looking at more about Nestle. But I just wanted to stop off at this right here just to show you that the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals, their partners are not only Nestle, but also Coca-Cola 
and Pepsi-Cola, as well as Red Bull, Unilever, and others. As you can see, Walmart, there's Walmart and others involved in all of this as well. So let us do this here. And as you can see up here, Sustainable Development Goals Partnerships Platform. Uh, Monsanto has a very bad track record. Mr. Queenie, yes, the uh, the Knights of Malta, the one who created Monsanto way, way, way back in the day. And we know that that's a very nefarious corporation. Isn't it really weird that all of the partners that are in league with the United Nations, their sustainable development plans are all corporations that have some very nefarious backgrounds or uh, some very shady activities that they've participated in over the years. So since, and that's what I want to do. That's what I want to talk about in this video as I want to talk about these shady activities going on by Nestle, Pepsi, Coca-Cola, some brewing com companies uh, like Constellation Brands, that's who we're all going to be looking at. So News 24 came out with an article about uh, Nestle and Pepsi and Coca-Cola where they recently it played host, Nestle recently played host uh, of an international symposium on water management. Um, well, you, you would have to actually own water to manage water, wouldn't you? Or you would have to have some kind of vested interest in the water. Well, isn't that the thing? that all over this globe, those three companies right there, because they are your big water, uh, bottled water producers, that they seem to have their hand in everything when it comes related to water, right? So this World Economic, uh, world, excuse me, Rented Lips, World Economic Forum in Pakistan through creating International Alliance for Water Stewardship. So we're going to be looking at the Alliance for Water Stewardship because that's important. And who is involved in that stewardship? Also, another to another group we're going to be looking at too as well. The company seeks to work with governments across the world in order to safeguard water reservoirs, storage, and supply. Safeguard? Um, they need to be safeguarded from you. Recently, Brabeck let, let Moth we're proud to announce the adoption of the Strategic Water Alliance Partnership, which will see Nestle in collaboration with the Department of Water Affairs and other companies, including Coca-Cola and Pepsi. Yes, this right here, SAB Miller. This is also one of your breweries. This is uh, this is uh, soon to be no more after the recent AB InBev acquisition. So the whole uh, Anheuser-Busch Miller now it's all owned by InBev, so we're going to be looking at them as well. I showed you SAB Miller was in there, right? Do you remember that SAB Miller? They're also in partnership with the United Nations. So, so the Desert Sun did an article where they were calling out Nestle for stealing water from the Strawberry Creek um, in Southern California. I do believe it was San Bernardino. And based on evidence gathered by water boards, investigators, and others, we believe that Nestle is diverting water for bottling, to which it has no legal right. A citizens group that helped unearth data about Nestle says, Nestle's unauthorized removal of water and hold the company accountable to the people of California for its wrongdoing over many years. Yeah. Not only were they taking out that water, but what's interesting is, is they've been operating without a permit to do this since 1988. And Nestle declined to provide a spokesperson for the article. And this is what is being said. The company claims to take water management very seriously and consistently monitor our spring sources for long-term sustainability. There's that word again. Rather than suing Nestle, they focused on the Forest Service for letting the company pull water with an expired permit. The idea is to get the Forest Service to issue a new permit. And this permit has been expired, everybody, since 1988. 1988. And the reason why that Nestle claims that they have a right to this water is because they said when they acquired the Arrowhead brand, the Arrowhead name in 1992, it came with the rights to water that was on national forest property, not national forest land. 
Okay, so does everybody understand the whole concept of public lands? Because that's exactly where they're getting the water from is public lands. And if you go to any BLM website or you go to the, the national uh, parks or, or the forestry or fish and wildlife, guess what? All of those public lands are owned by you. And these agencies will let you know on their website that the, the, the lands are owned by you. And they are tasked with exercising your rights when it comes to these lands. So guess what, everybody? That means that the water that is being sucked out of the ground on these public lands are owned by you, put into bottles, and then Nestle is selling back water that you own. Isn't that kind of like, you know, you parking your car outside and um, someone siphoning your gas and then you when you can't leave and then someone says, well, here, I'll sell you some gas. Well, and they're selling your gas right back to you. Um, doesn't make much sense, does it? Well, that's exactly what's going on. Exactly. And here is uh, less water in the creek means decreased habitat for vegetation and various species. Whether the groundwater extraction is harming the environment here is an open question. The U.S. Forest Service hasn't looked. The Forest Service has an explicit mandate to facilitate multiple uses of the land it manages. <laughs> Again, folks, I tell you that you own the land. These agencies, BLM, Forest Service, Fish and Wildlife, they manage, they exercise your rights to these lands for you. They tell you right on the websites. I've already did multiple videos on this issue before, everybody. This permit has been expired since 1988. Do you know how much Nestle pays a year to extract the millions of gallons of water out of this location? $524 a year. That's how much they're paying the Forest Service to extract your water that you own so that they can bottle it and sell it back to you at, at, at enormous prices, enormous profits. They lay it out. And here's the thing, everybody. As I said, the United Nations is, is in bed or in partnership with these corporations that I've just laid them all out for you. We're going to look at all of them. But take a, take a look at Nestle. Look at what they're all about. They're all about the profit, and it's all centered around water. But yet the United Nations wants to lead you to believe that, this, that all of their plans are going to be for you. It's all about you, right? Um, it's, we're going, we want to provide you with clean um, a water in abundance, right? Do you really think that that's what you're going to get when you have corporations like Nestle, Pepsi, and Coca-Cola involved in the whole plan? Wow. So, okay. Nestle is making hundreds of millions of dollars from this water. They're converting a public resource into private profit. You would think that an operation like this on public land would generate government interest. Oh, it doesn't. It has no scientific, it has not scientifically evaluated the effects of the groundwater extraction on wildlife, yada, so on and so forth. And Nestle continues to pump as long as it pays the tiny $524 a year access fee. So this is what Nestle had to say about uh, the government trying to step in when it came to them extracting the water out of Southern California. Nestle isn't going quietly. It has accused the Forest Service of threatening the water rights of bottlers around the state with its intervention. And it's countered with a proposal for voluntary measures, but the company hasn't shown any patience with federal oversight or environmental concerns. Um, so if all of these SDGs are about promoting a better environment or sustainable cities or sustainable, uh, development, all of these different things, but yet you have a corporation that you're in partnership with who could care less about the environment or could care less that they're stealing water from the public. Um, uh, uh, slap me, somebody slap me. Cause there's something wrong with this picture. Asked on Southern California Public Radio last year whether it would reduce water extraction, Nestle Water North America CEO said, absolutely not. In fact, if I could increase it, I would. Um, yeah, 
because you want to maximize profits. That's what you. That's the reason why you do it, right? So, so folks, I, I'm trying to make this understood. The people, the, the corporations that are involved with the United Nations and bringing about their SDG plans, they're not good. So I'm sure you've all heard what uh, allegedly one of the CEO, old CEO of Nestle had to say about water rights. And this is a fact. We don't know if that's exactly what was said, but we do know that Nestle did lobby at the World Water Forum in 2000 and successfully, by the way, to stop water from being declared a universal right. For Nestle, this means billions of dollars in profit. For us, it means paying up to 2,000 times more for drinking water because it comes from a plastic bottle. Now, in countries around the world, Nestle is promoting bottled water as a status symbol, which that's exactly what they are doing. Nestle is the global leader in the exploitation of water across the globe. It chose Pakistan for a number of reasons, one of which that it is the only country in the region that has an unregulated groundwater sector, meaning that anyone can simply dig a hole and extract as much, much water as they want without paying a penny. Why did I just say much, much twice? I don't know. But there you go. That's just some of the nefarious stuff that Nestle has been involved in. Well, I mean, hey, if they can get away with it, if it's, I mean, if it's legal to go into Pakistan and do that, hey, well, you know, but the thing is, is don't sit here and try to blow smoke everybody's asses saying that you're about wanting to be good stewards of water uh, for the public, for the people, because the people are what matter. Uh, no, as you've already, as I've already pointed out, and if you eloquently said in all of your sites, that the only thing that really matters is your bottom line and your profits for your shareholders. And that has become abundantly clear with all of your actions in the past. Here's something interesting is that on the part of big business to get international conventions and governments to reorient their perceptions of water from a human right to an economic commodity, documents like that of the UN Dublin Statement on Water and Sustainable Development purported controversial clauses such as principle number four, Water has an economic value in all its competing uses and should be recognized as an economic good. Um, right. So it's not a unalienable human right. It's not. It, it, humans have no right to it if you're a big corporation. A corporation has a right to it, but you don't because it has an economic good. They make money. You want to drink it, but they want to profit. You get it? No other company has taken this principle to heart more than Nestle. Besides perpetuating child slavery in the Ivory Coast coca industry, Nestle is a company which has foreseen the increasingly lucrative value of water as an economic good. Nestle is the world's largest food company, and Nestle's Waters is the world's largest bottled water company. This is from the Ann Arbor News, and you guys remember all of the stories that were coming out about water being extracted from Lake Michigan and being placed on uh, uh, big tankers and big plastic bladders or these big plastic bags of water being shipped to China. You guys remember those stories? Ann Arbor News covered part of this. The only thing they do import from us, they say, which needs to be stopped, is water. China is the biggest consumer of Nestle, which sells several bands, brands of bottled water, and the plant is based in northern Michigan. So Nestle is extracting water from the, the, the these lakes, or at least one of the lakes, and selling off the water that they're extracting not to you, but to China. And they have then pumped more than a half million gallons of water a day, drying up streams, ponds that feed the Great Lakes. So, <laughs> I, you know what, folks? It's, uh, boy, corporate control of water. Pepsi, Coke, Nestle, all single-use plastic bottles, a lot of them making their way into our oceans, and yet none of these corporations have spent a single dime that I can find in aiding in the cleanup of our oceans, yet they claim to be in partnership with the United Nations to bring about their 17 sustainable development goals, and one of them is to save the life under the water, under the oceans. 
Um, well, don't you think that you would start by cleaning up some of the mess that you helped create with these bottles, empty bottles of water? Uh, you would think, but that's just not the case. So before we move on to look at Pepsi and Coca-Cola, because they are like the other big major uh, 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 corporations that are involved in the water industry, let us take a look at this. The Sustainable Development Goals stress the necessity of private businesses' active participation appealing for their creativity and innovation to create value for the common good. The common good, sure. While currently some, especially recently formed private businesses, may consider the common good as their main business goal, most existing stock listed businesses clearly do not. The question that arises is why private stock listed businesses should voluntarily engage with such common good objectives while being principally shareholder value oriented? That is a very good question indeed. So let's take a look at Pepsi, and this is coming from the, their sustainability action here. Uh, and adopt the Alliance for Water Stewardship Standard as our vehicle for water advocacy in high water risk areas. Uh, so they're only talking about high water, uh, high, high water risk areas, right? Our actions include advocating for the adoption of smart water policies and regulations, Alliance for Water Stewardship. Okay, because I want to show you about the Alliance for Water Stewardship. AWS, or the Alliance for Water Stewardship, is a global membership collaboration comprising of businesses, NGOs, and the public sector. Members contribute to the sustainability of local water resources through adoption of the Alliance for Water Stewardship standard. Members grow and strengthen the stewardship community of practice by advocating the need for a common, independently verifiable, multi-stakeholder inclusive approach to water stewardship. Okay, so the question is, is can we buy what Pepsi, Nestle, and Coca-Cola are selling on their sites when it comes to uh, th their actions when it relates to water. Let us take a look. India and South Africa are not alone in this uh, usurpation of the public resources for the private sector. San Felipe in the state of Chiapas, a Coca-Cola factory run by FEMSA is draining wells, which forces local residents to buy bottled water. It is reported that this bottling plant consumes more than a million liters of water a day. FEMSA claims to be committed to the sustainable developments of its associates, communities, and the environment, but little action is seen to demonstrate this, they say. And in Brazil, Guatemala, Colombia, and Mexico, Pepsi Company faces similar problems with criticism for depleting water resources in these areas. Both Pepsi and Coca-Cola seek out the clean image it needs, or it seeks out the clean image, I'm sorry. It needs to win over public opinion. Much most of their claims are theater. You will never win over a population whose water you steal while selling the public their own water back to them, just like I showed you with Nestle and the public lands. In uh, the Indian state of Tamil Nadu, Indians have been protesting the condition of drought that has been pushed to the hilt by Pepsi-Cola and Coca-Cola depleting their local water resources. Petitioners have argued that thousands of farmers in that state have been suffering from water shortage and drought, while both companies freely use the river water for their commercial gains. So I ask, do any of these corporations care about mankind on this planet when they know exactly what they're doing and d does everybody realize that when you do the things that you're doing that it creates violence it creates protest it uh, also puts women in a bad position a lot of these women are the ones who are the ones who have to go out and seek out the clean water for their family uh, you know, the husbands work, uh, the women go out there and retrieve the water in some of these countries. Uh, some of these women are being beaten, raped or robbed or all of these different things. And because you're not making the, the, the water that you have claimed for yourself, um, these people have no access to. So I, if you're going to tell me that you're all about for women, you're all about for uh, sus sustainable uh, uh, cities, for uh, fostering goodwill towards mankind. 
your actions do not show that. Why would the United Nations partner with these corporations that are involved in all of these activities that have hurt man and not been there to uh, help? And as you can see, well, we're talking about the women because that's part of the sustainable development goals, right? It's all about helping women. Um, uh, there's just one of the goals is about uh, the youth. It's about women, sustainable cities, uh, about the oceans, about clean, providing clean water for everyone on this planet. Um, and what we're seeing is that that couldn't be further from the truth with all these corporations that are in partnership with the United Nations and these alleged goals that they are trying to promote. The relationship between access to water. The poor are the most vulnerable when there is an uneven distribution or lack of access to water. Lack of access to water is intrinsically linked to poverty and unemployment, displacement of peasants and indigenous populations. Women bear the brunt of the water crisis, traveling farther to get water and depending on polluted water sources for household activities. Sri Lanka and Thailand are high water stress countries. The situation poses serious challenges for food production, security in developing countries, and poses balance of payment problems for further debt exposure. We were gonna be looking at this payment problem and further debt exposure here uh, when it comes to Coco Bamba Bolivia, so you guys understand exactly what they mean by that saying right there. Okay, so as I showed you that SAB Miller, Right. They're also in partner with the United Nations, along with Bill and Gates Foundation, uh, uh, Bill and Melinda Gates, uh, Target or not Target, Walmart uh, and other corporations. So it's interesting that in Brazil, one of the largest aquifers in the world, one of that there were efforts by certain corporations to get a foothold or get their hands on the water out of this aquifer. These efforts fell under the spotlight late last month at the World Economic Forum in Davos, Switzerland, where the private talks were reported between Brazil's president and a range of top executives with interest in this aquifer in Brazil, including Nestle, Anheuser-Busch InBev, Coca-Cola, and Dow Chemical. These companies belong to the 2030 Water Resources Group. We're going to be looking at this Water Resources Group, a transnational consortium that includes, that's right, Anheuser-Busch, Coca-Cola, Nestle, and PepsiCo. That is who involved in this Water Resources Group. So, you know, it's interesting that Nestle says they got to be competitive. Uh, you're competing against people that you're in league with. You're, in, and you're, 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 you're claiming to be in com a competition with the same corporations that you've created, created an alliance with, with this water resource group. And they hide their intention to privatize developing nations' water supplies by claiming to facilitate open trusted based or trust-based dialogue processes to drive action on water resources, reform in water stress countries in developing economies. According to corporate accountability advocates in truth, the group is unmistakably activist, uh, uh, an unmistakably activist campaign by the private water industry to gain funding and credibility for a radical power grab. And just to show you also that PepsiCo makes it plain that they are a business avenger with uh, the United States Sustainable Development Goals as part of their plans for you. And they lay that all out here, right here, as you can see, Pepsi. So, so as you can see, I just was showing you about the Water Resources Group, this consortium that comprises of Pepsi, Nestle, Coca-Cola. So do you also see who's also involved? The World Bank Group with this water. Re this is from the Water Resources Group uh, and the World Bank Group. The water crisis requires public-private civil society collaboration and adaptive strategies to restart the economy, promote investments, promote investments, and create jobs. This video provides a brief overview of the 2030 Water Resources Group's multi-stakeholder platforms. Multi-stakeholder, yeah? 
So what we want to do now is we want to look more about the World Bank's involvement with the water situation when it comes to the corporations that are involved and other corporations as well. The World Trade Organization's agenda promotes corporate-led globalization. Corporate-led, mind you. Armed with the institutional support and legitimacy from the World Bank and the IMF, water corporations are the star protagonist of the new social order. They are undertaking a massive scheme to transform access to water from a human right. This is about Niger, but the tricks the trick is that Niger, as well as many or Niger, however you want to pronounce it, as well as many other countries, receives World Bank and IMF funds on condition that their utilities, including water, are privatized. Privatization of water is also one of the main demands of the G8 leaders are imposing on countries seeking debt relief and further aid. Since 1992, six privatization contracts were awarded to foreign, mainly French companies in South Africa. The loser of this affair are the poor communities for whom the right to water, a fundamental and unalienable human right, is denied. Violence against neighbors increased. What decreased was the people's dignity because they were forced to steal water from each other to survive. So all of the goals promoted by the United Nations and all of the corporations that they're in partnership with are all involved in all of these activities with the aid of the World Bank. And all of the violence that has come about in some of these countries over the privatization of water, um, how does that sound when you're trying to promote your goals of peace and unity on earth when all of this has created nothing but uh well you know what it's created anyway let's take a look at a few more things here when it co let's look at coca-cola when a local government ruling in the salvadoran town of neapa stopped coca-cola from drilling wells in the community residents thought their campaigns against the drinks giant had ensured their continued access to clean water but oh no 2015 success now seems under threat after the Salvadoran National Assembly recently took steps activists believe will lead to the privatization of the country's water supplies, and it involves Coca-Cola. El Salvador is one of the most water-stressed countries. 90% of the country's surface water is contaminated. Water scarcity has caused conflicts, pitting residents against companies like Coca-Cola. So we talked about the Alliance of Water Stewardship. That seems to be the, the en vogue word with some of these corporations. And I'll be showing you a couple other corporations that are using this. We saw Pepsi uh, was all about this Alliance of Water Stewardship. Members of this alliance own and shape the system. As the only stewardship initiative giving equal representation to all sectors, we ensure that the diverse constituencies impacted by water-related challenges. Consultations on the strategic development of the organization, multi-stakeholder collaborations over the evolution of the AWS standard and system. Our members tell us that it is the multi-stakeholder nature of our system um, is important. The group sharing of hard-won locally acquired knowledge on how stewardship can tackle water-related challenges. It is this shared insight born from the multi-stakeholder nature of AWS governance that gives us and our members a strong, credible voice on water use and stewardship. Yeah, it, 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 if you're from a corporate viewpoint, um, yeah, what does this have to do with the people, though? All of these corporations deciding what they're going to do with your water. So Bechtel, they also are, prom there's a lot of corporations. I mean, I mean I'm mean, i not singling out corporate because there's a lot. This this video is no by no means exhaustive as far as all of the corporations involved in the sustainability uh, project or the goals that are outlined by the United Nations. But it's important that I bring up Bechtel because they were involved in a water privatization um, scheme out with, with the World Bank out of Cocobamba, Bolivia. So I just wanted to show you what Bechtel says about their sustainability goals. The United Nations set 17 sustainable development goals, 
we felt compelled to join this movement and have committed to helping the United Nations achieve these goals. Resilience for millions. Resiliency is one of the society's top sustainability, blah, 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 sustainability challenges. Okay, well, that's rented lips. So Bolivia received by the World Bank uh, loans or, or money. And one of the one of the criteria uh, for them receiving the loan was that that they had to allow a corporation to come in and privatize the water, and it created a big freaking situation. And I'm going to share with you the situation out of Coco Coco Bamba, Bolivia. Bechtel's price hikes were met with the fierce public protest. Cocobamba, a city with a population of more than a half million, was shut down by general strikes. In an effort to protect the Bechtel contract, the Bolivian government declared a state of martial law and began arresting protest leaders at their homes in the middle of the night. Bechtel, in 2000, was forced to leave the country and the water company was returned to public ownership. In November of 2001, Bechtel and its associated associates filed their case and the process bars the public and media from being present at the proceedings. Okay, so when Bechtel was pretty much forced out of Bolivia, they took their case, which is interesting because um, why did they have rights to the water only because the World Bank had made loans to Bolivia? Well, they could force their hand to Bolivia to repay the loans in a different way or whatever the case is. But since Bechtel was forced out, they brought a suit into the World Bank Trade Court, the International Center for Settlement of Investment Disputes. Multinational corporations want to turn everything into a market, says Oscar Oliveira. For Bolivia, this retreat by Bechtel means that the rights of the people are undeniable. A revolt over water. In 1997, the World Bank made privatization of the public water system of Bolivia's third largest city a condition of the country receiving further aid for water development. That led, in 1999, to a 40-year concession granted to a company led by Bechtel within weeks of taking over the city's water, Bechtel's Bolivian company, Aguas del Tunare, raised rates by more than 50%, in many cases, much higher. Unfortunately, hundreds of foreign investor challenges against developing countries remain pending and more will be filed as the United States and others continue to force governments to give foreign corporations special privileges. And right, this was interesting, too. The challenge now is to build on this momentum to press for new trade and investment rules that promote democracy and sustainable development rather than the narrow interest of large corporations. What they fail to understand is, is that this sustainable development project, the stuff that, that they're doing, is in partnership with these large corporations, and they don't even realize it. Or maybe they do. So here's this word here that's becoming in vogue. Uh, as I've already showed you, Anheuser-Busch, ABMBEV. And Anheuser-Busch announcement of the 2025 U.S. Sustainability Goals and a long history of environmental stewardship. So as you can see, all of these corporations are all on the sustainability bandwagon. But all of them are involved in extracting water from different locations and not caring about the people that surround these water, these water resources. And that's what's so interesting to me. Um, the United Nations, if you really had these goals in mind, if you really wanted to promote these goals, would you be in league with all of these corporations that have a very bad track record. So we were looking at Bechtel and uh, what they were involved in out of uh, Coco Bamba, Bolivia. There's something that they say right here that I think that you'll find of, of, of interest. We respect, this is what it's talking about, eradicating modern slavery. We respect human rights everywhere. We operate and our actions are consistent with national law. What the hell does that mean? 
Okay, so do you remember where there was a military personnel who was uh, court-martialed because he actually beat down an Afghani guy, uh, a soldier, who had raped a young boy? And he was told that uh, that's how they get down there. In Afghanistan, that's the norm. There's no law against that. They can do that. So when you're going to tell me that we respect human rights everywhere, we operate and our actions are consistent with national laws. Uh, so what about a country that doesn't doesn't have any kind of laws when it comes to young children like uh, uh, Thailand or, or any of these other Southeast Asian countries where it's it's OK to have sex with young children? There's no national law against it. Is that what you mean when you say our actions are consistent with national laws? Uh, I don't know exactly what they're meaning by that, but I, I did find that of really, in, uh, 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 really interesting. I did. So, in the United States, the poster child for what is wrong with the privatization movement is Nestle Waters North America, a subsidiary of the Swiss-based food giant Nestle. The company commands a 32% share of the American bottled water market, and in its quest to supply spring water to American consumers, controversies over its water use has erupted in Texas, Florida, Maine, Michigan, New Hampshire, Wisconsin, and California. A foreign multinational coming in and bottling millions of gallons of local spring water only to transport it out of the basin presents moral, ethical, environmental, and economic questions. Consider brewers of beer. So now we're going to shift to beer makers. Budweiser, Miller, Coors, American brewers use huge quantities of local water. Here's that word again, and we're going to look at one brewer right here, Molson Coors, recognized as leader in environmental stewardship, all when it comes to water, and you can look right here. They're all into the sustainability movement, just right along with everybody else, and we're going to be looking at Constellation Brands, the third biggest brewer in the U.S., a deal between a state government and the U.S. third biggest brewer could put beer for Americans before water for Mexicans. And this is what they had to say about Constellation Brands. They are managing the water as if it were loot to be divvied up among them. That's what they say about Constellation Brands. On the Constellation Brands website under their sustainability... Conducting our business in an environmentally responsible manner to help mitigate our impact on water. Um, is, is this for the American people that you're talking to? Because your actions in other countries speak completely different volumes. And I'm ta talking about a volume of water. I'm talking about volumes. We are committed to protect the environment and the global communities. And recycling efficient use of water, serving as responsible stewards of water. Uh, there is that word, stewards. And they make it pretty, pretty, pretty dang clear when it comes to water under the sustainability. Water is important to us all as a natural resource. It is essential to the production of our brands and vital to our markets, consumers, and local communities. We are committed to serving as responsible stewards of water. Um, they made it pretty clear that it's vital to their markets and essential to the production of their brands. Um, that's pretty interesting. This is from Halliburton and their sustainability uh, that they're on board with. The Halliburton Guiding Principles for Sustainability. And they talk about it all right here. But has Halliburton tried to get into the whole act with water privatization? Ghana's water supply has been split in two. The supply of urban water will be leased to two private companies. There are five different companies tendering for the two urban water concessions in Ghana. One, this Suez Léoné de whatever of France and Halliburton of the USA. So the Halliburton Corporation wanted to get their uh, their hands into the whole privatization of water. So there's others as well. Raytheon. You guys remember Raytheon? I do believe this is a corporation that was started by one of the Bushes. Was it Venevere Bush or... 
Uh, one, I do believe that's what it was. I can't remember for sure. I don't want to speak out of turn and it'd be wrong, but I, I'm, I'm thinking towards that. Sustainability. Our sustain sustainability principles extend across our company, influence everything we do. Okay, is Raytheon wanted to get on with uh, any of this water privatization? Raytheon pushes for Guam water contract. Raytheon officials recently presented their plan to privatize the Guam Water Works Authority to the Consolidated Commissions on Utilities. So there's a lot of corporations that have that pull a lot of weight that, that they carry a lot of weight behind them and they are involved in and, and a lot of these are shadow government corporate Bechtel. I've already made many videos on Bechtel Corporation. Raytheon, Halliburton, all of these corporations that, you know, I could beat this into, you know, beat this dead horse, but um, just a few, a few little miscellaneous articles that I wanted to share. Uh, employing concepts such as sustainable development or decentralization, civil society participation, these are just some of the terms that they use. Um, and attempts to transfer water management to transnational companies. Yeah, just like I've been showing you. Nestle, Pepsi, Coke, Bechtel, Raytheon, Halliburton. All of this going on in Latin America. Privatization of municipal services in urban zones in this modal modality. Transnational corporations, appropriate distribution networks and purifying facilities with the help of new legislation on water that permits participation of private contractors. Privatization by bottling for transnationals. Coke, Pepsi, Nestle and Danone control most of this prosperous business activity. These companies are the subsidiaries of... These companies and their subsidiaries obtain water at extremely low cost and often in addition receive state subsidies to establish bottling plants. They then sell it for over a thousand times what it costs them to get it. Justifications for water privatization. Population growth. Every day there are more and more people who need access to water resources that are becoming scarce and overexploited, which causes social tensions and conflicts. Folks, when you have corporations that come in and take over a water supply, there's going to be conflicts. You have conflicts and then you're coming in and there's even more conflicts. So you're, this whole plan by the United Nations for the sustainable de development and you're in partnership with these corporations that have done nothing but created conflicts wherever they have operated. I, T tell me where I'm seeing this wrong. I am I wrong in everything that I'm seeing? The need to assign economic value to water. Water is wasted because people get it for free or for artificially low prices. Therefore, if its price reflected its true ecological and economic cost, people would avoid its abuse and overuse. Private water company executives say the prices they charge are high because water is costly and risky business and their companies must make a profit in order to remain competitive. Um, just like the oil companies, how they have colluded with each other to keep prices inflated and high for gasoline consumers, your uh, automobile drivers. These water companies are do Nestle, Pepsi. Coke, they've all formed alliances, the Alliance for Water Stewardship, um, the the other group that has the World uh, the World Bank involved with it. Um, folks, this, <laughs> the, there's no competition when you're all in league with each other. So this is a lie. But the high prices these corporations charge are not based on market rationality or ecologically sustainable criteria. The apparently independent companies that operate municipal aqueducts are for the most part subsidiaries of a half dozen transnational corporations that collude with each other and divide global markets among themselves. You know what? So one of the things, you know, this whole global governance, I showed you where Nestle was talking about corporate governance. Their effective and equ equitable management calls for a systemic long-term global approach guided by the principle of sustainable development, a priority among the tasks of global governance. 
So they want to govern the globe, the United States, but with partners with all that I've shown you. All of these corporations that the United Nations is in partnership with and all of the dark activity that's in, surrounded these, these, these corporations, you would think if the United Nations really had it in mind to bring about these goals for the people, that they wouldn't do it with corporations that have such dark stains in their history. So with the Agenda 2030, this is going to be with everything that I've showed you all so far. The growth of world population and production combined with unsustainable consumption patterns places increasingly severe stress on the life supporting capacities of our planet. Water. Unless well managed, and I've just shown you all of the corporations that are involved in managing water around this globe, and they are in partner with the United Nations. And this is from the United Nations itself right here. This is part of their goals, and they want to manage everything. And I've just shown you just one little piece all about the water.